Hey everyone, Rich Gasway here. Just a quick reminder about an awesome way to train your members on situational awareness that doesn't involve the expense of bringing me to your town. It's called the Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. The Online Academy is designed to help first responders improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making. It'll teach your members everything they need to know about situational awareness for a crazy, affordable price of only $97 per member. And it gets better. The pricing goes down as the number of students you enroll goes up. For example, if you enroll 31 or more members, the investment's just $49 a member. That's like half the price of a decent pair of gloves. Why is it priced so low? Because I made a vow that I want to help all firefighters get this training, and I don't want the cost to be the barrier. Since the Academy opened for enrollment in January, more than 800 students have enrolled, and for good reasons. Did you know that issues related to situational awareness are consistently identified as contributing factors in near misses and fatality events? Please, don't wait until your agency's had a critical injury or fatality. Don't wait. I work with many departments that have experienced critical injuries and fatalities, and I can tell you they're some of the most hurting organizations you can imagine. Please, don't wait for that to happen to you. I can help your members take their understanding of situational awareness and high-risk decision-making to the level that it needs to be. Visit samatters.com, click on the green button on the right side of the home page. There are two enrollment levels. For those that are enrolled in the premium class, they get to participate in a monthly webinar where I have thought leaders talk about important safety topics. Past guests have included Dave Dotson, Dennis Rubin, Chris Nam, Doug Klein, Joe Pernesti, Ron Canterman, John Murphy, um, Dan Sheridan, and more. Again, these webinars are exclusively for the premium enrolled students, and they get playbacks uh, in the course room in case they can't attend live. Okay, that's enough of the pre-show stuff. Roll that podcast intro. Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. This is Morris Lynch from the Rogersville Volunteer Fire Department. You're listening to Dr. Richard Gassaway on SA Matters Radio. The SA Matters mission is simple. They want to help us see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. Hello and welcome to episode 184 of the Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. Did you know I've been sharing this message of situational awareness and high risk decision making at live program events for 12 years now? and have trained just over 59,000 students, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, aviation workers, and more. Really, this message is for anyone who works in environments that are high risk and high consequence. If you or someone you know could benefit from training on situational awareness and high risk decision making, ask them to reach out to me by visiting samatters.com and clicking on the Contact Us tab. If you're new to this podcast, you've got some homework to do by going back and listening to some past episodes. I've released a new episode of this podcast every Tuesday. Never missed a week for more than three years. That's 184 episodes. No other podcast focused on improving worker safety even comes close to that track record. And I do this for you, the listener. You truly inspire me. And let me say this. I'm here for the long run. And for so long as I'm able, I'm going to continue to share this message. A message of hope. 
a message of inspiration, and a message of encouragement for everybody who works in high-risk environments. I want to make sure that you know how to develop and maintain strong situational awareness and how to make quality high-risk decisions. I'm dedicated to improving your safety and survival and to helping you accomplish the most important goal of all, to the go home to the ones who love you. And speaking of sharing the message, I'm coming to you today from my office in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I've just completed a month-long SA Matters tour of Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Back in August, I took my program to Evansville, Indiana, <clears throat> and Mike Conley, the fire chief there, did an amazing job of getting sponsors for the event. <clears throat> and it ended up costing his department zero dollars for the training. That's right, it didn't cost him anything. Paid for it all with sponsorships. I tell departments all the time that's a great way to host a training event, mine or someone else's, is to use sponsors. Usually this suggestion is met with skepticism, but Chief Conley's case, he wasn't a skeptic. He just said, show me how. And I did. And he went out and he got sponsors. A bunch of them. <clears throat> the company stepped up, offered financial assistance, and he said it really wasn't that hard. Sponsors for the Evansville program included Veteran, the gas and electric company that serves Evansville and other regions of Indiana, Deaconess Hospital, University of Southern Indiana, Evansville Firefighters Credit Union, Old National Bank, Global Emergency Products, Hoosier Fire Equipment, Mission Barbecue, Public Safety Medical, Seagulls Uniforms. When the dust settled on this, Chief Conley raised $15,000. That paid for the program, a situational awareness book for every attendee, paid for the venue, provide lunches for all the attendees, and because all of that together didn't cost $15,000, he now has seed money for another program in the future. How cool is that? I tell departments with limited budgets all the time that this is the way to go, and it is. If you want to host a program but you have limited resources, contact me, and I'll help you do what Evansville did, host a program using sponsorships. I always say where the will is strong, a way can be found. And folks, this training on situational awareness and high-risk decision-making, it's a game-changer. It really is. How do I know? Attendees tell me all the time. They tell me at breaks. They tell me at lunch. They tell me at the end of the day when the program is done. They send me emails. They post on my social media. They post on their social media. Understanding how to develop and maintain situational awareness is the foundation for making quality high-risk decisions can truly, and I mean truly, save your life. There's no simpler way to say it. One of the questions I get asked by readers and listeners all the time are, when are you coming to my area? I want to attend a program. Or where are you going to be next? Great questions, and I've made the answers really easy to find out. I've created a link right on the homepage of the website. It's uh, Just go to samatters.com, click the blue box on the right side of the homepage. It says, Upcoming Events Schedule. Here's something else you might want to know. If you want to save some money hosting a program, I do uh, what's called companion programs. Those are programs on adjoining days to other programs. So if you see I'm delivering a program within a few hours of you and you want to tag along as a companion, contact me. You can save as much as 20% off of a program cost by being a companion. And I have to do over 100 of those, and uh, no one's ever complained about uh, saving money and getting good training. That's a win-win scenario right there. Okay, today's feature segment is part two of a three-part interview that I had with two members of the St. Charles, Missouri Fire Department about a significant near-miss event they had on January 3rd, 2014 at a single-family residential dwelling fire on Nancy Drive. Captain Chip Ashford and Battalion Chief Dan Casey share the events as they unfolded. The thermal assault endured by these firefighters resulted in injuries that included second and third degree burns and a shoulder injury from a bailout out of a window. When I'm done with the feature segment, stick around and I'll tell you where you can attend an upcoming Situational Awareness Matters tour stop event. Who knows, maybe I'll be right in your state or right in your county soon. All right, we're going to jump right into our feature segment, but remember this is part two. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, go back and listen to episode 183 first. Okay, let's pick the story up where they start to talk about the change in conditions. They open that backsliding glass door. Uh, they put the fan in place, and as soon as they start to do that, and, and 
Dan can tell you on the video. I mean, it's that's the moment where it, it's almost so bad where the get there's so much, so much smoke now where the guys have to put their face right down next to the fan to even be able to start because um, they can't see it. Um, and, and that's and then you can just start to see the smoke churning and churning and and not, you know without looking at the timeline. But it's you know within a good 10, 12 minutes from that when you when Dan shows up with his camera and, and you look at the front of the building. Uh, the smoke conditions coming out of the front door are significantly different than what they were when the first companies got on the scene. All right. Keep the story going. Well, basically, um, you know, those smoke conditions, uh, well, because as soon as in the video, which was really great about the, having that video, is you can see the moment that they open that sliding glass door. They talk about the sliding glass door, and you can see – that there's smoke coming out of the basement in one direction. And as soon as they open up that sliding glass door, instantly the smoke conditions change directions or the smoke changes direction and speeds up. Now they haven't even started the fan yet. So we have that. In, and we talk a little bit about the wind direction. It's direct coming directly towards the Charlie side of the building. And, and what's our, we talk about flow path a little bit. we got that huge sliding glass door on the backside with a 17 mile an hour sustained 40 mile an hour gust coming in the backside, going past all these guys and coming out the front door to the point in the video, you see these guys uh, standing at the front door and smokes, black smokes just coming out of the front and then it stops. Well, why does it stop? It's two firemen coming out of that family room, walking down that hallway and coming out the front door. Well, as soon as those two firemen come out the front door, that smoke just starts back up again. And it's, it's just, it's incredible to watch that. And that's with, by that time, the fan is running and blowing out towards that sliding glass door. So you have all that energy trying to blow out the door and you have all that wind coming in and it's still pumping smoke out of the front door. And yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really good example of flow path and that, that's where we kind of get into it in class. But, um, you know, basically at that point, um, and, and it's basically a theory as you put it all together and, and you listen to the interviews and all that that Dan and I put together, but, uh, cause Tim talks about it in his interview where he comes to the top of the steps and, and everything, you know, he's like, I just see orange. He's like, the only thing I do remember is I see that fan to my left and it's completely engulfed in fire. Uh, and it's pointing at the back door. Um, but basically what we think happens is, you know, at some point that fan is trying to keep that wind in check to a point, which we know, you know, some from front, some of the NIST studies and all that stuff, you know, really about an eight to 10 mile an hour wind can overtake a positive pressure fan. So well, it's, can, hold on. Can let me ask you a question? It, yeah. I know you said initially the order was to positive pressure. They decided to negative pressure. Is the fan now back in the direction of positive pressure? No, it's still for It's still facing that back door. So they're trying to draw the smoke yeah. out out of the basement and blow it out the back sliding glass. Okay. Okay. Keep going. Um, so, but the problem is, you know, that essentially that wind just overtakes the positive pressure fan. I mean, it's, it's holding it to a point, but it's like Dan said, you can see the flow path and you can see it still overtaking it and coming out the front door. Cause that's the only two openings that are open right now is the sliding glass door in the front on the Charlie side and the front door on the alpha side. Everything else is closed. Every window's intact. Every, you know, everything else is closed. Up. Um, so as it's overtaken that at some point, enough smoke is generated in that room heat and smoke is generated in that room and that fan cuts out and it stops running obviously because it's a gas fan well when it does now it just gives it a direct flow path to go right out the front door there's nothing holding it in check you got that 40 mile an hour wind gust pushing in the back and the uh the second battalion chief that arrived on scene from central county had taken safe was a safety officer and was in the rear of the charlie side of the building and he calls out of the radio you hear him say hey i've got some fire here uh, on the Charlie side in that living room area, he says, Hey, I got it. It's in some bookshelves and it's starting to roll over the ceiling. Well, about, I think it's about 48 seconds later, you hear him call and say, that room is now fully involved. I need a line around here to the Charlie side of the building. And that's where Dan's videos picks up as a PIO. You know, now you see the front of the building and the smoke coming out and then Dan starts to make his way around to the Charlie side of the building. And all you have is a fireball blowing out this sliding glass door. And it's a, it's a great, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, right. It's a, it's a great video of the wind driven fire. I mean, it's the true thing that we talk about, you know, the changing of, of fire patterns. At one point, the fire is actually going down instead of going up. It's wrapping around the side of the building and, and it's just that constant change of direction. Of the wind. Where, where are the firefighters at? That's, yeah. right now? That's exactly what I was going to kind of put everybody into place here. Yeah. Uh, 
the reason that fire was allowed to get going. Now, if you think, hey, I got a line controlling the point of egress at the top of the steps, you know, uh, the guy should be able to hit that no problem. Well, this is where we have our closed loop communication problem. Um, we have um, a crew because because we're uh, I think we had five units on the scene at the time. And we talk a little bit about um, uh, span of control. Um, you know, uh, the incident commander has um, five uh, five units already on the scene, plus an ambulance and another ambulance. Calls for two more units, and I's it. And then the uh, the dispatch calls for uh, uh, personal accountability. So he's trying to do all these things at once, and he's just beyond his span of control. So that's where things kind of get lost a little bit. Just to explain, kind of sort of what happened here. The instant the uh, the crews were replaced in the basement, uh, and then uh, so the initial crew, uh, Matt and Scott, the initial crew that came in the first time, are now going back in for their second time, and they go down in the basement to finish up the job. Because as Matt would say, nobody's finished, nobody's going to put my fire finish put my fire on. He's going to make sure it's done right. Uh, he's a real fireman's fireman, and. Uh, um, so those, guys, those two guys are down there working in the initial fire room, making sure everything's out. Uh, there was a crew that was sent in to replace the crew at the top of the basement stairs to, point, to hold the point of egress. At this time, uh, at one point in time, they had called for a second line down there for a little bit of overhaul on the other side of the basement. So if you can imagine, uh, Matt and Scott are working in the, uh, the Bravo kind of quadrant of the basement. And uh, these guys would be working in the uh, the Charlie side, They're basically the other side of the steps in the basement. And so those those four firefighters are down there working. And if you ask any of those four firefighters what the fire conditions were down there at that time, they would all four tell you that the fire was out in the basement. They were just based. They were just doing overhaul, hitting hot spots. No big deal. Um, what happens is when those guys are called down to the basement, that's the that's the hose line that was to hold the point of egress. They were uh, the incident commander calls to replace that line with a third line to to the to protect that point of egress. It you can clearly hear it on the radio that that's called for, but at the same time that that company officer was listening to that radio traffic, his engineer was having a conversation with him, and he had just come out of the building and was being replaced at that time. So there was a lot going on for him. So he didn't necessarily get that radio traffic. He didn't hear it at that time, so he didn't respond. So he never really necessarily got that information. Well, the incident commander has so many things going on. He didn't wait for that response to make sure that that situation was happening or that, or that command uh, was being uh, uh, taken care of. And so now we have four firefighters in the basement with two hose lines and no hose line at the top of the steps and nobody had done any checking for extension. So that's where our problem comes in. And we not only do we have that, now we've got a, a positive pressure fan blowing at the at the point where the extension did come through, which was the wall on the uh, on the Bravo side towards the back of the building. Um, it had come through the uh, the electric, uh, the chases in the electric and things like that um, through the walls. So when all this is going on, um, we have four guys in the basement and nobody on Division One at the time. Uh, the uh, safety officers in the back of the building says, Hey, we got rollover on the, uh, on division one on that Charlie side coming from that wall where they had the extension. And so they call for another hose line to come in and take care of that. Um, the, uh, they had a writ line out front and the writ line was not charged. It was just laid out, ready to go. It was on a separate uh, truck. It had a thousand gallons of water. Um, so as firefighters, this, the, the crew that was assigned to take that extra line in was, a, was one of those two extra pumpers that was called in. The acting company, or the, I'm sorry, the company officer goes in, looks, and says, yeah, we got a, got a fire. We need the hose line. Tells his jump man, go get a hose line, bring it in. They were told to get it off of a certain truck. They did not. They saw a hose line laying in the front yard that was unoccupied. So what do they do? They grab that hose line. Why is that hose line unoccupied by the RIT team? RIT team was called to turn the gas off. So they had difficulty because of the weather, another domino here. Uh, the, the gas meter was right by that basement window where they were flowing water in with that big fog, right? And so that gas, that gas meter is frozen. So, so it takes the entire RIT team over there and they're trying to figure out, you know, 
how to get this gas shut off. And this chip says it's like a union job. It's like one guy working and, and four guys watching or whatever's going on over there. So, uh, but uh, so they, they were distracted a little bit and that hose line's left in the front yard all by itself. Oh, I need a hose line. What's a firefighter going to do? Instead of going over here and grabbing this off this other truck, like I'm supposed to, I'm just going to grab this one right here. So they grab it and they start calling for water. Well, where's that company officer going to call for water from? The truck that they were supposed to get the hose line from, right? So not the hose line that that truck that that that's off of. So now we're calling for water off of a truck, and by that time, somebody goes running up to that truck and says, "Hey, charge your line, charge your line." And that engineer says, "I don't have any lines off my truck to charge." So uh, we never do get water. Therefore, that fire is allowed to uh, to progress, and because of the wind conditions, it's progressing fast. And we talked to that. We we interviewed that company officer and said. You know, what were your conditions when you walked in? He says, I had a normal run-of-the-mill looking kitchen fire kind of thing, you know, burning up the walls, rolling the ceiling. He said, by the time I turned around and uh, went to get my jump man for that hose line and yell at him for not having water, by the time I turned around to go back up there, he said the fire had completely engulfed that entire room and was rolling down the hallway at him and they had to evacuate. Yeah, so, he describes it He just describes it as laying underneath underneath a fighter jet engine. Um, as they're, as they're crawling down the hallway, he says, I, I, he says, I, I'm sitting there in the hallway, I'm waiting on the line. And as I look up and I, and I feel some stuff fall on my shoulders, some debris fall down onto, onto my shoulders. And he said, at that point I look up and it, it looks like a jet engine flowing down that hallway. Uh, and Dan talks about, you know, when we talk about a Venturi effect and, you know, you're taking that huge room of fire and, and shoving it into a 36 inch hallway. And now it just speeds up and comes down the hallway. He says, it's blowing over the top of his head. They can't get water. He is a late arriving company, so he has no idea where people are at. He doesn't know there's anyone in the basement. Uh, so, you know, just crew safety says, okay, hey, guys, we're going to pull out of the building. We, we sound the evacuation horns. Uh, but those, those guys are still in the basement at the time, and he has no idea. So what happens is with, with these guys, these four guys in the basement, Tim, uh, who was on the ambulance, uh, and Kirby, uh, say they're, they're at their 50% mark, and they're going to come out of the basement. They tell uh, Matt and Scott at the other end of the building, uh, hey, we're leaving. And he's like, okay, no problem. And Matt tells, says, hey, I had this little, you know, little, one more piece of duct work that he wanted to pull down uh, before he went out. They were about 50% too. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Has the evacuation order already been sounded? I mean, no. no. It, it, okay, so we're we're kind of backing up on the timeline from these guys that are getting pushed off that – Division one hallway with that jet engine fire where we're, we've backed up in the timeline some. Yeah. So we, we okay. backed up in the timeline in the sense that right before the evacuation sounds, this is okay. the conversation going on between the guys in the basement. Like Dan said, uh, you know, Tim and them say, Hey, we're at 50%. We're going to head out. Things are going okay. Um, the, the problem is, and it's that drop in communication is right. As all of that is going on, they're calling for a 20 minute accountability. And they've also told those guys to evacuate the basement but they haven't heard any of that radio traffic. They missed all of it. And, and Dan always talks about, you know, he said, I've asked all four of those guys, did you hear any of that radio traffic? And like, nope, we didn't. We had no idea what was going You've on. You've got guys yeah. screaming, dropping the F-bomb on the radio, calling for water on that first floor. And you, I asked all four of those guys, I said, did you hear any of that radio traffic where they're screaming for water, talking about, you know, I mean, the, you, you can hear, see it in the video. I mean, guys are screaming on the radio for water, and none of those four guys heard any of that. All four of them have radios? All four yes. of them had radios, yeah. Uh, did you confirm the radios were on the right channel and on and all of that? Uh, you know, in other words, was it, was it, was it, was it, what was going on inside of their mind with their hyper focus on the task and such? It was causing them not to hear the radios. It was, this wasn't a radio problem, right? I don't no. believe it was a radio problem at all, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll talk, and we talk about it in communications a little bit. I mean, the only thing, like with Tim and Kirby's radio, and you'll understand, we kind of put where they were at, but both of those, their radios were so damaged uh, that there was no way for them to call out later, uh, you know, when they got to the point of May Day. Um, but so, yeah, so Tim heads to the top of the steps, uh, or starts to head to the steps, and he, in his interview, he says, I was at the bottom of the steps, uh, Kirby had the line, he said, I looked up to the top of the steps, and all I see is orange at the top of the steps um so he says hey give me the line he starts to head up he says i open the line i start to flow water and then everything darkens down uh and and he truly says he says i i thought i got it 
Like I knocked it down. I thought I got it. We're getting a little low on air. So he's like, Hey, let's just head out. Um, and we'll figure it out from there. You know? Um, so as soon as he said, I put the line down and I started to hit the top of the steps and it comes back and it comes back with a vengeance. And he said, I'm completely engulfed in fire. Uh, he said, I reached down to try to find the line again and I couldn't find it. Um, you know, which, and, and he really beats himself up about it. And that's part of what we'll talk about in class, the mental side of all this and, and the aftermath of it. But, uh, you know, he really beats himself up about it. And, and I said, well, Tim, you can't, <laughs> when you look at and you play it all out, I understand why you couldn't find it is because you, you knock it down, you lay it down. Uh, when we had his, his SCBA mass tested uh, from Scott, uh, they said it took an 1100 degree blast directly to his face piece. So that's that moment we think he takes this 1100 degree blast directly to his face piece to his body. So it's the shock to your system and all that stuff, the, the O moment, you know. Um, and so now he can't find the line and he has to make that split second decision. So he says, hey, we're just going to head out. So they, they take off down the hallway, uh, which actually they're at the top of the steps. They're looking at the, at the living room and it's a complete 180 degree turn to head to the front door. Um, he says, I look down that hallway and it's completely engulfed in fire. So I know I'm not going that way. So he goes straight across to the right, which actually leads into the kitchen. Uh, and Kirby's just following along with him at that point. Uh, they head into the kitchen. He's, he's feeling the wall and, uh, he finds the first opening he finds is into the dining room. Um, so he makes the right turn into the dining room and now for the next, uh, it, and all that at that time, as far as timeline goes, when he says he's making the right into the dining room, is when the evacuation tone start. So that's when the horns go off. So for the next minute and 45 seconds, they're circling the dining room trying to find a way out and have gotten turned around a little bit. And, you know, obviously they're taking a huge heat, you know, all this heat condition and everything else going on. Uh, the other problem to this, and, and it goes into complacency in that, is unfortunately the, that night uh, when they went into the building, uh, obviously it's late in the fire, things are winding down or what they think is winding down. Uh, Kirby didn't. Kirby had his hood on around his neck, but never pulled it up over his ears. So Kirby crawled around in that flashover condition for a minute and 45 seconds with no hood. Uh, so he's got uh, he had second and third degree burns from his neckline all the way up, lost most of one ear, uh, most, multiple skin grafts, uh, spent about 18 weeks off of work, you know, in and out of the burn unit trying to recover from that. Um, so, but they're, so they're turned around in the, in the dining room at that point. As all of that is going on now, Matt and Scott are starting to head out of the basement because they've got low on air and they're going to head out too. But again, have no idea any of this is going on because they're, you know, they haven't heard it come over the radio. Uh, they get to the top of the steps. Uh, Matt Matt describes he says I'm walking up the steps and it's dark and black. He said which it should be because there's no lights on. We haven't put any lights in this place or anything yet. And he says as soon as I hit the top of the steps, it's like getting sucker punched. Um, all of a sudden, it's just I, fire comes over the top of me. It, it wraps around. I turn around. I look at Scott behind me on the steps. Scott's completely engulfed in flames. Um, and, you know, it, he has no idea what's going on. So fortunately he was able to reach down. He ended up finding the hose line, uh, <laughs> which, and, and, you know, Matt's a pretty funny guy. He talks about it in his video, in his interview. He says, I find the hose line and I start pulling on. He said, one of two things was going to happen. I was either going to find the nozzle or I was pulling the fire truck through the front door. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So he, he eventually finds the nozzle at that point, you know, he says, right, you know, I got one more bolt left in the gun. Let's open. So he opens it up. And at that point just starts whipping around, tells Scott to get out. Scott makes the right turn. He knows where the front door is. So he makes the 180 degree turn and heads out. And, uh, you know, Matt talks about, it. he's like, I just, at that point I dropped the line. He's like, I don't even know if I was still flowing water or not, but I just, I got rid of the line and I headed out the front door. So, and, the, and they're actually the first two that, you, when in the video you see it, you actually see Matt first because as they're coming down the hallway, as soon as they get out of the front door, Scott falls off to the right and just kind of lays there on the front porch. Well, Matt can't see. He says, I, I didn't even know I was out of the building. It's so smoky. I can't even see where I'm at. So he said, I just kept crawling and, and eventually he runs into somebody. That's how they found out that things were going bad. We we might have missed it at some point in the conversation, um, but was there a mayday anywhere in this? No, there wasn't actually. Uh, the only May Day um, when when uh, when guys when we see Matt coming down the the uh, walkway and realize that there were still people in the building because I don't think everybody understood that not everybody was out of the building. Uh, 
we know that those two guys, and then everybody's like, well, where's Kirby and, and uh, 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 Tim? Where's Kirby and Tim? And, and where's that? Where's 9417? Where's 9417? They realized we're two people still missing. That's when the mayday was called, and it was called by a company officer outside of the house. So outside of the building, so that, so that everybody understood that there was a mayday situation and we were missing two firefighters. Um, yeah, and, and that's where it goes back to their radio. So Tim and Kirby talk about in their interviews. They both tried to call mayday, uh, but what, what happened for them is at the time we didn't have a uh, policy on how to carry our radios or anything. We were on the old VHF system. Uh, and Tim and Kirby both did the same thing what most guys did. They put it in their front radio pocket, they took the cord, wrapped it around their neck, and they clipped it on the side of their coat. Well, when you look at their radios, you have pictures of their radios. It, it completely burnt through the cords. There was nothing left. So Kirby said, I tried to call Mayday. Nobody ever heard it. Tim actually said he reached up and tried to grab his mic, and it was gone. And when he came out of the window, it was dragging about 15 feet because it got caught on something. It was burnt up and you know dragging 15 feet behind him. Uh, so neither one of them ever had a chance to even call for help or you know anything. Tr- trying to give you like a timeline of work when uh, because people are going to watch the video, I hope. Um, when the air horns go off for the evacuation tones, we talked about Tim and Kirby were making the right into the dining room without a hose line. The other two guys, uh, Matt and Scott, were were coming up the steps to the point to where they actually had a little conversation. Uh, Matt and Matt talks about it in the interview uh, afterwards. He says the evacuation tones are going off, and he said he turned around on the steps and looked at Scott and said, "What the heck are they doing? The fire's out." What's going on? Why are they evacuating the building? And, and that's how crazy it is. And then he said he was, he was walking up the basement steps, walking up the basement steps into that orange. And he said, like he said, it got, he was sucker punched uh, into, a, into a bad situation. And that's what's, what's interesting, uh, again, is to be able to talk to these guys afterwards and say, what was going through your mind? when all this was going on, you know, how to get out of the building and, you know, those things that we talk about, you know, when we teach our, um, our young firefighters through the Academy, you know, what to do, feel a wall, find a window, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and we teach about maydays, um, you know, you can pee and all that stuff, you know, what's going through your mind when you actually go and get into that situation. And these guys will tell you that that stuff was out the window. I wanted to, I wanted to get away from the heat find out where it wasn't hot. And if I, if I was trying to find out where it wasn't hot, I was crawling to the black. They talk about, it. I'm just crawling to the black and stay as low as I can. Cause I want to get away from that heat. And, um, to, to, uh, to talk to guys who were that close, uh, to not making it out of the building, it kind of gives you a little bit of a better perspective on what we really need to be, um, you know, instilling in our firefighters. So if you get into a situation Hey, let us ask you the questions about, you know, I want to know what your problem is and, and where you think you're at and, and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, just tell me that you have a mayday. I'll ask you the right questions just so you can get it out because most of the time they're trying to just get the heck out of there as fast as they possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. Kirk, Kirby talks about it specifically. He says, you know, in his interview, he says, you know, that you can't pee stuff, how much air I had. He's like, I couldn't remember anything. He said the, the, the only thing that was on my mind at that point was not dying. That, that was the only thing going through my mind. And, and like Dan said, it's specifically Tim and them both talk about it is that I knew this, if it was orange over here, that was hot. Black over here is not as hot. So that's the direction I'm going. And that's why they end up getting turned around a little bit is because they're, you know, they're basically at this point, they've lost their direction. They're just trying to get away from the fire. Uh, and, and about that minute, 45 second mark after the evacuation, when they're uh, circling around in the basement uh, or in the dining room, you know, Tim says, I got to the point where he said I was just tired of burning up. I was ready to give up because he said every time I would stick my arm up, you know, he was reaching up trying to bang on a wall trying to find a window. And he said every time I would stick my arm up in the air, I was getting burnt uh, to the point he had second, third degree burns up both of his arms uh, from sticking his arms up in the air. Uh, but he said, I, I actually, he said, I picked up my spot. I curled up in a ball and uh, I was ready. And, and him and Matt both talk about it at some point that, uh, I was ready to take my mask off because I knew if I took my mask off, just took one big deep breath, uh, it would get I would get it over with, um, and I wouldn't have to go through the pain of that, you know, burning up anymore. Can you imagine that? Being in so much pain and being burned so bad that you're thinking about taking your face piece off so that you can end it quicker. That's not the first time that that's been shared 
in a near miss interview with me. That's that's it's incredible. Just incredible. Be sure to join us next week for part three and you hear how this story turns out. I have a favor to ask of you. If you've experienced or witnessed a near miss and <clears throat> would like to have a platform to share your lessons learned, just like Chip and Dan are doing here, contact me. The whole reason I launched this podcast was to give voice to people who've had near misses, just like you, just like Chip, just like Dan. Think about it for a moment. The lessons shared from your workplace near miss could save the life of someone else, and that's really powerful. What a wonderful gift that would be. Contact me if you want to share your experience. If you want to send me feedback, just go to the SA Matters website, click the Contact Us tab, send me your feedback. You can contact me on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn as well. In the event you've missed me somewhere along the road or you're not connected with me on social media, recent at Situation Awareness Matters tour stops have included Cleveland, Ohio, Nashville, Tennessee, Evansville, Indiana, Redmond, Washington, Lexington County, South Carolina, Chesapeake, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, Topeka, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, Davis, California, Dallas, Texas, Sydney, Australia, Melbourne, Australia, Perth, Australia, Wellington, New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand, Antwerp, Belgium, and Amsterdam, Netherlands. During that international tour, I delivered 14 programs and flew 77 flight hours. Now that I'm home, I'm pretty darn tired. I crossed 53 hours of time zone changes in the month of October. That's crazy. Now I absolutely love what I'm doing and feel so blessed to be able to share this message with first responders, business leaders, industrial workers, medical and military personnel, specialty trade workers, and others throughout the world. Now that I'm back, if you want to join me, November 2, I'll be in Billings, Montana, doing a program for Phillips 66 Refinery. November 4th, Madison, Wisconsin. November 9 to 12, Clearwater Beach, Florida. November 16th, back in Billings, Montana, with Phillips 66 employees again. November 20th in Boston, Massachusetts, November 30th to December 2nd, Evansville, Indiana. December 5th, the All Hazards Incident Management Team Association Conference in San Diego. December 7th and 8th, Niagara Falls. December 11th, Canfield, Ohio. December 12th, Wintersville, Ohio. December 13th and 14th, Solon, Ohio for an evening program. December 14th through 16th, Twinsburg, Ohio for daytime programs. And sometimes in early December, my son Cameron and his wife and Alicia are going to be expecting their first child, my first grandchild. I'm not sure if I'm ready to be a grandpa yet, but from everybody I've talked to who are grandpas, they say it's the greatest, the greatest, and I'm really looking forward to that. If you want to see the location of all the upcoming Situation Awareness Matters tour stops, just head over to the SA Matters website, click on that blue box on the right side of the homepage. Check back often, though, because the schedule changes um, quite a bit. I'm actively booking programs now for 2018. So if your company or agency or association or regional conference or state conference or national event might want to host a program on safety, situational awareness, high risk decision making, safety leadership, just contact me through the samatters.com website. Contact me tab, top of the homepage. I have great staff. They'll make the entire process e- easy for you, I promise. The last time I was delivering programs in southwest Minnesota, I stopped by and visited the sponsor for this podcast, Midwest Fire. Midwest Fire is a fire truck manufacturing company, and they make the amazing all-poly-bodied fire apparatus, and it's changing the industry. You really should check them out, MidwestFire.com. That's MidwestFire.com. Anyhow, while I was there, I got a chance to sit down and talk to some of their employees about what separates Midwest Fire from their competitors. Here I got a chance to ask account executive Dalton Lingbeck about why Midwest Fire doesn't have a dealer network. Let's listen in. Okay, Dalton, I got a question for you. No dealer network. What's up with that? Are you guys just not big enough to have a dealer network or you know what what's what's the strategy here for not having a dealer network for a for a fire truck manufacturer that's a little bit out of the norm yeah no it's 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 not that we're not big enough it's really because we actually had people that have come to us and want to be dealers for us and it's it's a more of a strategy for us to be more direct with the customer uh, we really want to have direct communication with them and 
well, the benefit for them as well is that they have direct communication with manufacturing. So really the beautiful thing is, is that when customers call us and talk to us about trucks, um, they're talking to a account representative at the facility. So if they have questions that we can't answer, we're 10 steps away from engineering, we're 20 steps away from production. So getting the, question, getting the answers to their questions is really efficient and really easy. Um, it really keeps costs down as well. Uh, when you deal with the big guys and they have big dealer networks, they have commission structures for their dealers. Mm -hmm. uh, you're dealing with a middleman, <laughs> where we don't have those, those costs. So we look after our customers, make sure that their trucks are affordable, and we make them even more affordable with not having those dealer networks. And then finally, I mean, miscommunication is minimal, uh, basically because, like I said, you're dealing with us at the manufacturer facility. Um, we, make a, we make contact really efficient and uh, it's just direct, so it's really nice. Yeah. So <clears throat> when if I go to a conference and I see a manufacturer, you know, they're they're they have some trucks there, and their and their booth is just swarming with people. And I'm guessing, well, I'm not guessing. I know those are all their dealer reps. And then I walk over to Midwest Fire, and I see your apparatus on display, and I see some of your people there. Those aren't dealer reps. Those are people from right here in Laverne, Minnesota, that are, that have gone to the conference. And, and you're, t you're talking to the direct people that are going to watch that truck being built beyond the, beyond the walls that we're sitting in. Exactly, yeah. So we don't bring anybody else except people that work and are employed by Midwest Fire. Uh, yeah, you'll see in our booth, you'll see a variety. You'll see the account representatives, so your sales guys. And then you'll see some years we bring engineering. Some years we bring people from the shop, on the shop floor, from production. Uh, our CEO, Sarah Atchison, is there every single year. You can talk to her. Um, we bring people from the office. It's just, uh, it's everyone you talk to is directly here at the facility in Laverne, and it's it's nice. Yeah. So if you're wondering what differentiates Midwest Fire from their competitors, there you have it, right from the horse's mouth. So check them out at MidwestFire.com. Thank you, Midwest Fire President Sarah Atchison and all your staff for your awesome commitment to improving first responder safety. Hey, if you're not a member of the SA Matters community of learners yet, what are you waiting for? There are over 9,000 connected here, sharing ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to train employees to be critical thinkers and resilient problem solvers. Joining is free, and when you join, you'll get my monthly email newsletter that contains featured content from the blog and the podcast. It really is the best way for us to stay in touch with each other. And the easiest way to join is a sign-up like participants do at live events. Text SA Matters to 22828. That's S is in Sam, A is in Adam, Matters, all together, SA Matters, one word, to 22828. 22828. You'll get a message back about getting access to my program handouts. Those are the same program handouts the students get at live events. So in addition to joining, you get the value-added bonus of getting a program handout. That way you can see what's being taught during the classes as well. If you want to get connected with me on Twitter, you can follow at Rich Gasway on Twitter. We can get connected on LinkedIn. Just search for Rich Gasway on LinkedIn. You can watch my videos on YouTube by going to the SA Matters TV, all one word, SA Matters TV YouTube channel. And on Facebook, you can like the SA Matters page on Facebook. Well, that's it. Episode 184 is complete. Thank you to my guests from St. Charles Fire Department, Captain Chip Ashford and Battalion Chief Dan Casey. Thank you to our awesome podcast sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to all the companies and agencies and organizations that have hosted live events. Thank you to all who've attended the virtual training event on National Situational Awareness Day on September 26th. Thank you to the more than 800 students enrolled in the Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. And most importantly, thank you, you the listener of this podcast show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. 
If you are interested in booking Dr. Gasway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgasway.com.